she would be worth more dead than alive. There are people in this world who live their lives always putting others first. People who consistently give everything they have to ensure the happiness, comfort, and safety of those around them. Then there are others who have suffered more in their childhood and teen years than some people will in their entire lives. Young people who were abandoned and neglected, who yearn for stability, love, and comfort. Both of these types of people can be taken advantage of whether someone preys on their kindness or their vulnerabilities. But when one person has the chance to take advantage of both of these types of people at the same time, the consequences can be devastating. But before we get into the case, I want to talk about one way that we can all help keep ourselves safe from scammers, spammers, data brokers, and anyone else who may want to target and hurt you. Your full name, email, home address, health records, your family members, all of that information is out there on the internet for anyone to see, and that is why I started using Aura, the sponsor of today's video. Aura helps keep me and my information safe by showing me which data brokers are selling my information and automatically submits opt-out requests for me. Cleaning up my information from the web has helped me to reduce the amount of spam I get, which was a lot, and helps to protect me from hackers who could use this information to access my accounts on social media, my bank accounts, or any other sources of sensitive information. When I saw just how much of my personal information was out there for anybody to see, I was absolutely shocked. Multiple of my social media accounts got hacked last year. It was so bad. And if I didn't act fast, I could have completely lost access to all of my accounts. I had someone messaging my family members asking for money and trying to trick my grandmother into thinking I was in danger. It was just horrible. And having to go and explain everything afterwards was just a pain. But now I can feel so much more at ease with Aura knowing that hackers can no longer access my information. Once I set up my account with Aura, they found 16 different sites that were selling my information and started working immediately to protect my privacy. This means removing my phone number and addresses from unwanted sites, leading to reduced spam calls, spam mails, and honestly just peace of mind knowing that my data is being protected. But Aura does so much more to protect me from online threats that I can't see. With Aura, I get other features like antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, and so, so much more all within just one app. Even if you already have one of these tools like a VPN, not having Aura is like locking your front door but keeping your back door wide open. Aura is a one-stop shop for everything you need to protect yourself and your information. Aura is really easy to set up. It's super user-friendly and the best part is that you can get it all at one affordable price. Aura is always on doing the hard work to keep me safe so I can focus on other tasks, not worrying about my accounts being hacked and losing everything that I've worked so hard for. To me, that is priceless. I value my privacy and I value yours too. To keep yourself and your information safe, head to aura.com slash Rachel Shannon to get started on your 14 day free trial today. Once again, click the link in the description box below and head to aura.com slash Rachel Shannon for your 14 day free trial today. Thank you again so much to Aura for partnering with me on today's video. Also, if you can't tell, I am in a new space. I have a completely new setup. I love this color that I have in the background now, but I am still moving into my new place. I'm still setting everything up. So if it's a little bit more echoey today, I do apologize. I'm still working to get the soundproofing done. I'm still working on getting things in this room to absorb the sound. So again, I do apologize if the sound is a little bit off, but I am working on improving that. But with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing a wild, wild ride of a case involving the death of Lisa Knafel. Lisa Knafel was born on May 2nd, 1971 in Reynoldsburg, Ohio. Lisa had previously been married to a man named Nicholas, and together they had a daughter named Megan, who was born in 1999. However, by 2003, her and Nicholas got divorced. By 2006, Lisa went on to marry Kevin Knafel, who had a son from a previous relationship named Cody. 
Together, Lisa and Kevin went on to have one daughter, Haley, who was born in 2009. Cody actually lived with his mother while Megan, Haley, Lisa, and Kevin all lived together in a nice three-bedroom home at the end of a gravel road in a rural suburb of Willoughby Hills, Ohio. At the time, Kevin worked as a truck driver while Lisa worked as a social worker for their county's Department of Child and Family Services, working in the sex abuse department. Those who knew Lisa described that she loved children and had a passion for helping others. Eventually, she started taking in foster children to help provide a stable, loving environment for children who needed temporary housing. Lisa's friends and family members said that whenever Lisa would take in a foster child, she treated them as if they were her own. She loved them and supported them, giving everything they needed to feel comfortable during their times of fear and uncertainty. That same was true when Lisa and Kevin decided to take in 16-year-old Sabrina Zunick. Sabrina Zunick was born on October 27, 1994, just outside of Cleveland, Ohio, to parents Mark and Susan. Both her parents were known to struggle with drug and alcohol abuse. They both had frequent run-ins with the law, being arrested on several drug charges, disorderly conduct, and driving under the influence. Then, by the time Sabrina was a year and a half old, Mark had been arrested for domestic violence. By all accounts, things within the home where Sabrina grew up were not ideal for a child. For some time, Sabrina was living with her father and grandmother, but according to neighbors, Mark was pretty much always drunk and angry. According to one police report involving Mark's disorderly conduct, he was a schizophrenic who refused to take his meds, so that led him to become violent and act out. Not only would he scream and yell at Susan, Sabrina's mother, whenever she was over, but he would also take out his anger on his own mother. Of course, living in such a chaotic, unstable environment was not good for Sabrina's development. When she was a child, she was diagnosed with ADHD, oppositional defiant disorder, anxiety, depression, and bipolar disorder. By the time she hit her teens, she too started to act out. She was very quick to anger, constantly threatening her peers and getting into fights at school. Her behaviors got to be too much for her grandmother to handle, so eventually she found herself sent to a youth group home for structural behavioral modification. She spent about a year there, and while there, she was placed into foster care. At some point, Sabrina did start doing drugs, though we don't know exactly what she was into. Eventually, Sabrina's behaviors at school started to get better. Teachers and school staff said that she kept to herself for the most part. She was quiet, timely, and always finished her assignments. For some time, it seemed that things were looking up for her. By mid-2011, Sabrina was taken in by Lisa and Kevin to live in their home. At first, this seemed like a great situation for Sabrina. The home was in a quiet, safe part of town. The family were loving and accepting of her. She grew close with her foster parents and foster sisters, even saying that she saw them as her own sisters. She started to do really well in school, and people around her noticed a shift in her personality. However, before long, issues started to arise at the home. At first, Sabrina got along well with the family, but as time progressed, problems started to emerge. Sabrina started to feel that Lisa was giving her foster sisters preferential treatment. She started having tons of fights and arguments with both Lisa and Megan. She started to feel that the way Lisa was treating her had changed, and she no longer felt like a part of the family. Eventually, she told friends that Lisa actually made her life a living hell. Meanwhile, as Sabrina and Lisa drifted apart, she and Kevin grew closer and closer. According to Sabrina, she saw Kevin as a friend and father figure. He allowed her to be open and honest. He never judged her and always made her feel wanted and accepted. Now, according to one friend who would frequently visit Sabrina at the home, she could tell that her and Kevin had a much closer relationship than she and Lisa. The two got along really well, and any time there were issues, Kevin was the first one to stand up for Sabrina. But there were many times that this friend visited Sabrina where she did notice that Kevin would be pretty touchy with her. She got a bit of a weird feeling from them, like maybe they were a little bit too close for a foster parent, foster child relationship. They were making sexual jokes out loud to one another, which was really off-putting for anybody who visited the family. 
Again, not things that a father and daughter duo should be joking about. But again, for some time, despite these weird feelings that people were getting around them, despite these arguments and fighting with Lisa, it did seem like things within the home were going relatively well, as you could expect with a foster child entering a home and an environment that they're not familiar with. Sabrina turned 18 on October 27th, 2012, which meant that she would be out of the foster care system, but she petitioned to remain at home to finish out high school, so that was a sign to those around her that she enjoyed living there. But this facade would come crashing down at around 1 a.m. on the morning of November 16th, 2012, when the Willoughby Hills Police Department received a 911 call from the Knafel home. On the other end, the operator heard as 13-year-old Megan, Lisa's daughter from a previous relationship as we discussed earlier, was hysterically screaming and crying. She started shouting, please, oh God, my mom's going to die in a panicked tone. She told the operator that she woke up to her sister trying to kill her mom with a knife. In the call that lasted just under four minutes, we hear as Megan panics and screams and tells the operator that her mom is going to die. You can also hear as she begs her sister to stop before the call drops. It's a really distressing call to listen to, so just be prepared. This is a 911 call. What's going on there? 
Shortly after this call was made, officers arrived to the scene. The first officer who arrived to the scene said that as he was pulling up to the home, he saw Megan run out of the door screaming that he needs to hurry up because her sister was stabbing her mother to death. He entered the home, ran down the hallway towards the bedroom, and yelled for the attacker to come out with her hands up. She complied, and when she stepped out of the room, the officer saw a young woman absolutely covered in blood from head to toe. She was sobbing, still holding the 12-inch kitchen knife that she had just used in the attack. If you haven't guessed by now, 18-year-old Sabrina had just stabbed her own foster mother in a vicious, frenzied attack. Officers then cuffed Sabrina and brought her outside while other first responders tended to the scene. In that bedroom, officers found 41-year-old Lisa lying motionless. It was clear that she had numerous stab wounds all over her body. They attempted resuscitation efforts, but by that point, it was too late. She had lost far too much blood and there was nothing they could do to save her life. Meanwhile, as they examined Lisa, they found a small child, Lisa's youngest daughter, Haley, hidden in the closet, hysterically screaming and inconsolable. After all of this, of course, Lisa's body was sent off to the medical examiner's office for an autopsy. There, the ME found that she had been stabbed multiple times to her head, neck, torso, and extremities. They found one stab wound to her jaw that penetrated deep enough to sever her carotid artery. Another stab wound through the chest was deep enough to puncture and collapse her lung. They also found that multiple stab wounds showed signs that the person doing the stabbing was twisting the knife as it went in. She had numerous defensive wounds to her hands and legs, including two fingers that were cut so deeply that the fingers were almost completely severed. Because of the time of night and the way Lisa was found, it was stated that Lisa was attacked while she was asleep. She woke up in the middle of the attack and tried to defend herself, but it didn't work. In total, Lisa had 178 stab wounds. She suffered from the most horrific, violent, brutal attack by the hands of her own foster daughter, a teenager who she graciously took into her home to protect her and provide her with food, shelter, and comfort. Of course, at this point, the biggest question is why? So now going back just a bit to the initial scene. After arresting Sabrina, she started hyperventilating and was not answering any of the questions the officers were asking her. Once at the station, she was so exhausted from everything that she fell asleep. Police weren't able to get anything from her after the initial arrest. I want to note that while the murder of Lisa was taking place, Kevin was actually out of the house driving his truck, so he didn't actually have to be there for any of it. He didn't witness anything. Authorities called him to notify him of the horrific news, which prompted him to return home immediately. According to the officer that called Kevin, after hearing the news, Kevin actually appeared relatively calm and collected. At that same time, after learning about the horrific murder of Lisa, friends and family members started calling and coming over to the home to see Kevin and offer their condolences. One friend came to drop some food off so Kevin wouldn't have to worry about cooking, especially for their young daughter. When the friend spoke with Kevin, he noticed that Kevin didn't appear to be all that upset or shocked. He appeared pretty normal. The friend would later say that he didn't necessarily know how someone is supposed to act in this situation, but the vibes that he was getting from Kevin were definitely off. The friend also noticed that inside the home, Kevin still had a photo of Sabrina hanging up on the fridge. Again, this was the day after the murder and he knows that Sabrina was responsible. So why did he still want to see a picture of his wife's killer on display? Then at Lisa's funeral, friends and family said much of the same. Once again, Kevin appeared calm and collected. He didn't seem all that sad. He appeared emotionless. Now, again, as we say in all of these videos, of course, we can't necessarily judge how someone is going to react in a situation like this. We can't say that this person isn't acting sad enough for our liking because some people just don't show emotion. Some people just act like that even when they are actually grieving. But still, 
the way he was acting was a bit odd to friends and family. At this point, investigators couldn't come up with any sort of motive. They knew who was responsible, but they had no idea why. But as they looked more into family dynamics and specifically the relationship between Kevin and Sabrina, the pieces of this puzzle started to come together. Now, after the initial arrest, like I said, Sabrina was not talking. She sat in jail thinking that she was going to be getting out, that Kevin was going to get her out of this, that her and Kevin would figure this all out together. But... As time passed and Kevin didn't save her, basically ignoring her while he benefited from his wife's death, she decided to start talking. She told her social worker that her and Kevin had been involved in a sexual relationship for a few months before Lisa's murder and that Kevin was the one who encouraged her to murder Lisa so that they could be together. According to Sabrina, in late 2011, a few months after moving in with the Knafel family when she was still 17, Kevin started asking Sabrina for massages. She started by massaging his inner thighs because he told her that they were sore from his job being a truck driver. After a few months of doing this on a more regular basis, it progressed to her massaging his genital area. By April of 2012, the family went on a camping trip to North Carolina. It was during this trip when the relationship between Sabrina and Kevin turned overtly sexual, with them touching each other and basically giving each other hand jobs on a regular basis. After this trip, Sabrina stated that she started to have feelings towards Kevin as more than just her foster father she started to have romantic feelings towards him. It was around this time when the relationship between Sabrina, Lisa, and Megan started to go very downhill. Lisa and Sabrina would regularly argue. There was one incident where Lisa had to physically restrain Sabrina because of how upset she was getting. Then Sabrina started talking about how she wanted to be a mother figure for Haley, which resulted in Lisa taking Haley away and limiting their interactions. By the summer of 2012, Kevin and Sabrina progressed from being handsy with one another to performing all sorts of sexual acts on each other. That fall, he would drive her to school every morning, and in those car rides, they would give each other oral. Around that same time, just before turning 18, her and Kevin started having sexual intercourse on a regular basis. Sabrina had also opened a checking account and had Kevin as a co-signer. She would deposit her own money into it from checks she was getting from the government after her biological father passed away, but Kevin would also deposit money into the account. He started taking sexual photos of her, and they would often buy each other gifts. By September of 2012, the fights between Lisa and Sabrina became more and more intense, and Lisa started to express to Kevin that they needed Sabrina out. She no longer wanted her living with them. Now, this isn't overtly stated in any of the documents I read on this case, but to me, it appears that with this sexual relationship with Kevin, Sabrina started to feel like Lisa was getting in the way. She wanted to replace Lisa. She wanted to be Kevin's partner. She wanted to raise their little daughter. She wanted to be everything Lisa was. At the same time, I'm sure Lisa could feel the tension. I'm sure she knew something was going on, even if she didn't know exactly what. I'm sure there was a lot of tension that was building up in the home, leading to all of the fighting and arguing. By October 27th, as I stated earlier, Sabrina turned 18, but elected to stay in the home with Lisa and Kevin. It was at this time in which Kevin started to express to Sabrina that he no longer loved Lisa and wanted to be with Sabrina full time. The problem was though, he couldn't get a divorce because then they would have to share custody of Haley, who was three years old at the time. This is when Sabrina and Kevin started to discuss getting Lisa out of the picture altogether. Around this time, Kevin started looking into the life insurance policy Lisa had and found out that she had two policies, one worth about $500,000 and another worth $250,000. So in total, they could be banking $750,000 if Lisa was dead. After seeing this, Kevin told Sabrina that Lisa was worth a lot more to them dead than alive. 
With Lisa out of the way and with the money from the insurance policy, Kevin and Sabrina could be together and raise a family together. At least, that's what Kevin told her. By November, Kevin and Sabrina started coming up with an actual plan for how they would kill Lisa. First, they considered trying to hire a hitman, but that idea was short-lived. After that, they decided that Sabrina would use a pistol to kill Lisa. Sabrina was supposed to obtain a gun that couldn't be traced back to Kevin. Then, she would wrap the nozzle of the gun in a pillow to muffle the sound as she shot Lisa. She was to hide the gun in the basement where Kevin would come in and get rid of it after the fact. They even planned a day to go to the shooting range where Kevin would teach Sabrina how to shoot. However, every time they wanted to go, Lisa insisted on joining them. Who knows if it was because she felt that something was going on or if Lisa genuinely just wanted to spend time with her husband and go shooting with them. Who knows? But either way, because of this, the entire plan fell through. By the morning of November 15th, 2012, Kevin was driving Sabrina to school when he started to break down about a fight he and Lisa had. Kevin started crying and was banging his head on the steering wheel saying he can't stand this anymore, so he's going to kill himself if Lisa isn't dead. To this, Sabrina said that she could kill Lisa. They had discussed exactly how she was going to do this in great detail. They were now deciding that she would use a knife and she would attack her at night after she fell asleep, but before Haley would come in the room to sleep with her mom. She was to wear tight clothing that covered her from head to toe. After entering her room, if Lisa was lying on her side, she would start by stabbing her in the back between the shoulder blades. After the stabbing, she was to go to the garage and remove all of her clothing, leaving them in a trash bag outside. Then, she would go back in and ransack the place to make it look like a robbery. She was supposed to clear out all of the clothes drawers and jewelry boxes around the house. If she was caught, she was going to plead insanity or claim self-defense. To Sabrina, this was a perfectly laid out plan. It was foolproof. Nothing could possibly go wrong. And with Lisa out of the picture, she and Kevin could be together and raise little Haley. In the early morning hours of November 16th, Sabrina did exactly as she was told. She went into Lisa's room while she slept, starting by stabbing her one time. However, Sabrina was surprised when Lisa woke up and started to fight back. She thought that she could just stab her one time and just be done with it. As Lisa fought for her life, Megan woke up and saw what was going on, watching in horror as her mother was being viciously attacked. She called 911, and while she was on the phone with the dispatcher, Lisa was actually still alive for some time. But despite Megan's desperate pleas with Sabrina, she continued stabbing until she was sure Lisa was dead. By the time Sabrina heard police cars arrive, she cut herself a few times to try and make it look like self-defense. When she was first arrested, she was in a state of hysteria. She was hyperventilating, panicking, and in shock from what she had just done. But in the days and weeks after, she was claiming that she blacked out because that is what Kevin told her to say. Then, just hours after Lisa's murder, so later in the morning on November 16th, Kevin was already on the phone with the life insurance company asking to file a claim. He started the process to file the claim, completing the paperwork by November 23rd. Over the course of the next six months, Kevin started receiving payments of around $200,000 totaling about $800,000 in life insurance money after all of the payments came through. And he had fun with that money. He purchased a house in Florida. He bought a boat. He started taking flying lessons for small planes, and he bought three new cars. He was out there living it up with his dead wife's money. As Kevin was receiving hundreds of thousands of dollars, Sabrina was sitting alone in a jail cell. She started to feel abandoned by Kevin. She realized that he was not going to be helping her out of this. So by May of 2013, she decided to talk. She first told police that she wanted to confess because, quote, I'm not the only one who did this. That is when she told police everything I just told you now. At this point, the motive was now clear. It made a lot of sense. 
it seemed like Kevin took in this vulnerable 17-year-old girl who was relying on him for her safety and well-being. Instead of being a father figure, he groomed her, he manipulated her, he sexually abused her, making her think that all of this was normal when it absolutely was not. It was wrong. Then when he decided that he wanted Lisa out of the way, he used Sabrina to do his dirty work. However, obviously investigators couldn't just take Sabrina at her word. They had to do their own investigation into the claims to figure out the facts of what truly was going on. Police went and spoke with several people who knew both Kevin and Sabrina. Several family members said that they were concerned about the relationship between the two. It felt inappropriate. Some family members would ask questions about what was going on between him and Sabrina, but he never gave them a straight answer. Sometimes Sabrina would allude to family members that Lisa didn't like her and Kevin's relationship. She didn't like how they spoke to one another, how they acted around one another. Then there were people at Sabrina's school, including teachers, staff, and social workers working directly with her who also noticed the weirdly close relationship. One time, Sabrina got in trouble at school, so Kevin came and had a meeting with her and the school staff. During that meeting, Sabrina sat on Kevin's lap as they all spoke. Obviously, given that she was not a little kid, this was really weird to staff. On another occasion, Sabrina was talking with her probation officer from a prior incident that she had when she received a call from Kevin. During the call, the officer said that Kevin was noticeably agitated because Sabrina had been bringing up the possibility of dating another boy from school. After the call, Sabrina told her probation officer that she couldn't understand why Kevin would be upset with her wanting to date because she was almost 18. But as we know, it wasn't her age that he was upset about. It was that he owned her and he didn't want her with anybody else. Then one of Sabrina's friends at school came forward to police and told them that a few weeks before Lisa's murder, Sabrina had approached her telling her about the plan to kill Lisa. She had even brought up hiring a hitman to get rid of Lisa. But as we hear in so many of these cases, the friend didn't take her seriously. She did not think that Sabrina would actually be capable of murdering somebody. In addition to the people who Sabrina and Kevin interacted with, police also spoke with Lisa's circle. Several co-workers of Lisa's stated that in the weeks before her murder, Lisa seemed very distracted at work and was having a hard time concentrating. There were times where Lisa would answer her personal phone, step away to talk, and then come back looking devastated. Others said that Lisa confided in them that she was worried about the relationship between Kevin and Sabrina. Clearly, she was seeing things that were right in front of her eyes and she didn't like it. Now, during all of this, of course, police looked into the cell phone records and digital communications between Kevin and Sabrina. They found absolutely no evidence of them ever talking about a plot to kill Lisa at any time. So most of the conversations had to have been in person. Because of this, they didn't really have a lot to prove what Sabrina was saying. Police did start questioning Kevin, asking him about the relationship he had with Sabrina. They asked about certain witnesses that had come forward speaking of their relationship. Anytime police inquired about anything to do with their relationship, he either denied it or claimed to have no idea what the witness was talking about. They were able to obtain a search warrant to search Kevin's home, and when they executed it, they found that the home had been extensively remodeled since Lisa's death. Obviously, this is suspicious, but Kevin claimed that he started the remodeling process before her death, so they simply were not related. Once again, they found no incriminating evidence on any of the electronic devices within the home. However, despite the lack of direct evidence on the electronic devices, the story that Sabrina told was compelling. Not only that, but Kevin's behaviors sort of confirmed what she was saying. Witnesses saw them acting pretty inappropriately towards one another. Kevin didn't act surprised or upset when his wife was killed. Then, literal hours after finding out his wife was brutally murdered, he filed a life insurance claim. All of those things point towards a man who may have been in an inappropriate relationship and who couldn't care less about his dead wife. 
So a few months after Sabrina opened up to police on August 9th, 2013, 43-year-old Kevin Knafel was arrested and charged with conspiracy to commit aggravated murder and complicity to aggravated murder, as well as six counts of sexual battery. After Kevin's arrest, Sabrina worked with the prosecution on her case to come to a plea agreement. She pled guilty to murder in exchange for a sentence of life in prison with the possibility of parole in 30 years, Plus, she had to testify against Kevin at his trial, which began in June of 2014. Are you knowingly, freely, and voluntarily pleading guilty to one count of aggravated murder? Yes, sir. Sabrina Zunich admits in open court on Thursday that she stabbed and slashed her foster mother, 41-year-old Lisa Knafel, 178 times in Knafel's Willoughby Hills home in November 2012. Did you purposely cause the death of Lisa Knafel? Yes, sir. And did you use prior calculation and design and planning in order to commit that murder? Yes, Your Honor. Zunich's guilty plea is a formality because in June she provided damning testimony against the mastermind of the murder, Lisa Knafel's husband, 43-year-old Kevin Knafel. What was his relationship to you? It was when a foster father when needed to be and when a lover when, when not being a foster father. Zunich told the jury that after Kevin Knafel seduced her and began a sexual relationship with her, he convinced her to kill his wife so that he could collect $785,000 in insurance policies he had on Lisa Knafel's life. Can you describe for us or give us an idea of exactly the statements that Mr. Knafel made to you about his wife being gone? Um, she would be worth more dead than alive. I stabbed Lisa Knafel to death with the cooperation and and planning with Kevin Knafel. And you stabbed her, you cut her as I understand it, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. On multiple occasions, correct? Yes, Your Honor. The prosecution was arguing that Kevin took advantage of a vulnerable 17-year-old girl who was living under his roof. Sabrina had a checkered past, which involved being neglected by her drug-addicted parents. Eventually, her mother abandoned her, leaving her with her grandmother and abusive father. She had to grow up watching her drunk father abuse her grandmother and verbally berate her. Eventually, her grandmother could no longer handle her, so she was sent to foster care. From there, she went from house to house until she landed with the Knafels. Kevin took her in and initially acted as a loving, caring father for her. She was happy that she had two adults in her life who she could look up to. She could finally be a part of a happy, warm family. But Kevin quickly turned that parental love into grooming her until she was completely dependent on him for her physical and emotional needs. That led her into resenting Lisa, who she saw as competition, because that is how Kevin was treating the situation. He was constantly telling Sabrina, if Lisa were out of the way, we would be rich and happy. He repeated this until eventually Sabrina agreed to do Kevin's dirty work. But after she finally did it, Kevin abandoned her leading her to ratting on him. The court heard from numerous witnesses who all spoke on how odd and inappropriate their relationship always seemed. Again, there was never any overt sexual acts or kissing done in front of anybody else, but just the way they acted towards one another told those around them that there was more going on behind the scenes. And as I stated before, Sabrina did testify at Kevin's trial where she told the jury everything I just told you. She appeared very remorseful, crying when she spoke about how she killed Lisa. She talked about how accepted she felt by Kevin and how she didn't even realize how inappropriate their relationship was until she had already fallen for him. She was completely under his thumb and would have done anything he asked of her. On the other hand, the defense claimed that Sabrina acted out on her own. She was angry towards Lisa and she took her anger out on November 16th all on her own. They said that Kevin had nothing to they said that Kevin not only had nothing to do with this, but he didn't even know about the murder until he got that call. They argued that there was no evidence of an inappropriate relationship between them. There was no DNA, no videos, no text messages, nothing. The only evidence they had were those witness testimonies and Sabrina's word. At the end of the trial, both sides made their closing arguments and the jury went off for deliberations. 
they found that Sabrina's testimony was enough to convince them of Kevin's involvement. So they came back with a guilty verdict on all counts, including conspiracy to commit murder, complicity to murder, and sexual battery. For these charges, Kevin was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 30 years. They also sentenced him to two years for each of the six counts of sexual battery, which are to run concurrently. Upon Kevin's release, he must register as a sex offender. 43-year-old Kevin Knafel showed no emotion as he was brought in the courtroom this morning for sentencing. His defense attorney says his client maintains he is innocent. Knafel was found guilty in June on 11 counts on this case. Their foster daughter, who was 19, said it was Knafel who hatched the plan to kill his wife, Lisa, and collect $785,000 from various life insurance policies. She said she was following Knafel's plan when she stabbed her 178 times in November of 2012. During Wednesday's sentencing hearing, the victim's ex-husband called Kevin weak. Kevin Knopfel's defense attorney objected. Later in the hearing, the ex-husband cursed at the defense attorney and he was ordered removed from the courtroom. Before the sentencing, the prosecutor said there has been no remorse on Knopfel's behalf throughout the court proceedings. Knopfel chose not to speak on his own behalf prior to sentencing, but his attorney says they plan to appeal. There was a substantial amount of information that we were not permitted to put in in uh, our defense of Mr. Knafel. There was information that the judge didn't believe was relevant. The judge didn't believe that uh, Sabrina Zunek's mental health was relevant to the conspiracy. We're pleased from the standpoint that um, that it's a, a good long stretch. He's 44 years old, so he's not going to see the light of day until at least he's 86 years old. Right after the sentencing hearing, Knopfel was brought back to jail. He will now be taken to prison to begin serving that lengthy sentence. After this, Kevin did file an appeal, pointing out several errors he believed his defense team made in defending him. However, his appeals would ultimately be denied. And as of right now, he does remain behind bars, serving out his sentence for his involvement in his wife's murder. And as of right now, that is all of the information we have on today's case. This one is definitely a case that I think many of you will have differing opinions on. On one hand, it can be argued that Sabrina is her own person. She made her own decision to kill Lisa. Even if Kevin was suggesting that she do it, even if he was trying to manipulate her, she still could have said no. After all, she was 18 and she could have left their home if she wanted. Therefore, the responsibility is hers and hers alone. You could even go as far as saying that maybe Sabrina did make up the allegations against Kevin. After all, there was no concrete evidence that he ever told her to kill Lisa. Therefore, Kevin's involvement can't be determined beyond a reasonable doubt. On the other hand, you can argue that Kevin took in a vulnerable young girl with lots of trauma, including fear of abandonment. She lived her life without a proper father figure and without a mother. All she wanted was to be loved and accepted, and being that she was so vulnerable while Kevin was in a position of power over her, she was susceptible to his manipulation. He groomed her until he had control over her emotionally and physically. And because of how much control he had over her, she felt like she had to kill Lisa so that Kevin could be free from her. Yes, she was the one who committed the act and deserves to be behind bars for it, but it would not have happened if it weren't for Kevin telling her to. Therefore, Kevin also belongs behind bars. Those are basically summaries of what both sides could argue, so I'm really curious on which side you're leaning towards or if you have any more to say on this. Now, I do tend to believe Sabrina. I do think that Kevin played a large role in this case. I don't think Sabrina would have killed Lisa if it weren't for Kevin's manipulation. And yes, I do think he sexually abused and groomed her. Obviously, a 43-year-old with a 17-year-old is all sorts of wrong. I do think he manipulated her, making her feel sorry for him that he had to deal with Lisa. I think she truly believed that her life with Kevin would go perfect if only Lisa was out of the way. Yes, 
Sabrina deserves to be behind bars because Lisa did not deserve to lose her life and she could have said no. She could have stopped this all from happening. But I do also think that Kevin is right where he should be. Now, the other part of this is that there wasn't a lot of concrete evidence to show Kevin's involvement. So I'm also curious to hear what you guys all think about this jury. Do you think they came to the right conclusion? If you were on that jury, do you think you would have found Kevin guilty or do you think you would have let him off because there was not enough evidence? Let me know. Either way, this case was such a heartbreaking one. It's so wild how all of it played out. My heart absolutely shatters for Lisa, who was murdered by someone she was just trying to help. Also for Megan, who had to witness her own mother being horrifically murdered. And for Haley, who had to see all of this happen, not understanding any of it because she was only three. I can only hope that they're all doing okay in their lives now. But with that being said, please sound off in the comments. Do you think Sabrina acted alone? Do you think she was manipulated by Kevin? If so, do you think Kevin deserves to be in jail for his role in the murder? Do you agree with the jury finding him guilty or do you think there wasn't enough evidence? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell too on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Spotify. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy and I hope to see you next time. Bye!